the original BART cars, the original Washington, D.C. Metro cars, the first turbo train, the Boeing LRV. What do they all have in common? They all were built by aerospace companies. And then what happened? The aerospace industry quickly exited the transit car building business for good. Hi, this is Jeffrey. And in this video, we're going to look at why aerospace cannot or has been somewhat incapable of building for transit. Now, in the late 1960s and into the early 1970s, a number of aerospace firms such as the Roar Corporation, RLHR, or Boeing tried to get into the transit car building business. Now, in the early 1970s, as the Vietnam conflict was coming to an end, there were less orders coming into these aerospace firms for aircraft parts and, and aircraft manufacturing systems. So they decided to look to other heavy manufacturing industries such as rail cars. Now, at the time in the early 1970s, there were three major transit car builders in the United States, which was Pullman Standard, uh, the St. Louis Car Company, and the Bud Company. And there was a perception that these three companies were resistant to change, especially technological cha change. So if aerospace companies had started to build transit cars, well, then they would be more technologically advanced than the cars being built by the old line car builders. Now, what happened was they sort of failed, meaning the aerospace companies sort of failed at this, especially going towards the mid-1970s, and then they exited the transit car building business altogether. Now, I found a really, really interesting article from the New York Times from 1971 that uh, goes into why the Roar Corporation could not properly build the BART cars for San Francisco. And so this shows why uh, you cannot easily go from one type of industry to another. You know, you would think that, well, if uh, an aerospace company can build, you know, an F-15 fighter plane or a 747, they can easily build a subway car or a new type of trolley car. Well, that really was not the case. And this article sort of outlines uh, the problems that these aerospace companies had in transitioning to this new type of industry the transit industry. So let's start looking at and reading through this article from the New York Times in 1971 while we also view images of the vehicles that are described in this New York Times article. Here's the article titled Rough Ride in Rapid Transit from the New York Times of September 5th, 1971. Chula Vista, California. The Raw Corporation, the first of what is becoming a throng of aerospace companies knocking at the doors of the nation's public transit operators, is finding out that rapid transit can provide a rough ride. When Raw won a $66.7 million contract to develop and manufacture 250 high-speed computer-controlled commuter cars for San Francisco's new Bay Area Rapid Transit, system, also known as BART, on August 28, 1969, old line car builders that had lost the bid reacted with a mixture of anguish and predictions that Roar would fall on its face. Fellow aerospace manufacturers and many professionals who ran transit systems around the country and longed for an infusion of new ideas in a rusty, tradition-bound industry cheered it on. Two years later, Roar is still wrestling with stubborn design and reliability problems and has built only 10 prototype cars. The project is six to nine months behind schedule, depending on how the contracts are interpreted. Company officials won't say whether they expect to make a profit on the project. We've had some bloodletting and there's no denying that we've had some problems, Frank E. McCreary, the company's president, said during a recent discussion at Roar's plant about the problems an aerospace manufacturer encounters when it diversifies into other markets. But, Mr. McCreary continued, 
We have no thoughts about turning back. We're hitting some rocks and it's tough, but we're not giving up. It's surprising that we've had problems. Or it's not surprising we've had problems. It, the BART car, is a quantum jump in rail transportation, requiring a sophistication and reliability in excess of anything in the past. We have every reason to believe the car will come up to specs or better. Privately, some company officials regard the problems Roar has experienced and the possibility of a loss as the price for a head start in what is expected to become a substantial market over the next decade. Until Roar landed the BART contract, there were three suppliers of rail passenger cars in the nation, Pullman Standard, a division of Chicago's Pullman Incorporated, the St. Louis Car Division of General Steel Industries Incorporated, and Philadelphia's Bud Company. For the most part, they dominated an industry that until several years ago was in the final stages of a terminal disease. The long-haul passenger car business was all but dead. Except for limited orders from New York and Chicago, there was little demand for commuter intra-urban transit cars. The first significant reversal of the trend occurred five years ago when New York's Metropolitan Transportation Authority bought the Long Island Railroad and began major public commitment to improve rapid transit lines. MTA officials now admit they made an error when, in contracting with the Bud Company to supply cars that were far more technically advanced than any built before, they did not first require construction and testing of several prototypes to work out any bugs. The wholesale failure of new Bud cars after they were put into service on the LIRR created a stormy, stormy political controversy and, for a while, seemed to threaten the political future of Governor Rockefeller until the cars were debugged. Now, it appears the rapid transit industry is on the threshold of a major economic renaissance, and a growing herd of aerospace companies is trying to cash in on it, with old line manufacturers standing by with growing anger. The drastically changed market picture was forged by the growing national distaste for rush hour traffic jams that congeal many cities, increased national concern for the environment and the passage by Congress last year of a mass transit aid bill that will provide more than $3 billion in federal aid to transit systems during the next five years and possibly as much as $10 billion over the next decade. Rail transit systems, largely because of their high cost and inflexibility once they are laid, are expected to meet transit needs in only a handful of large cities. The bus will continue to be the dominant mode of mass transit in most places, according to transportation authorities. Nevertheless, much of the expected $10 billion will be spent for rail transit lines, and that is why there is a qui for salesmen fanning out from an industry that was all but counted out a few years ago. The Bud Company dropped out of the industry last year after its costly debacle with the Long Island Railroad cars and an almost equally dis disastrous experience with the cars it built for the high-speed New York to Washington Metroliner. This left only Pullman and St. Louis Car Company to carry the flag of the traditional industry. The first outsider to have a go at rail transportation was the United Aircraft Corporation, which built its lightweight turbine-powered turbotrains four years ago. It ran into long and expensive manufacturing difficulties and problems in producing a system reliable enough to work day in and day out in the railroad environment. In some ways, the problems previewed those Roar would encounter when it tried to use aerospace expertise in the field. United Aircraft Corporation still has high hopes for turbine-powered trains, although the project is now at a lower key. When Bud opted out of the business, the General Electric Company, a longtime rail propulsion, propulsion gear supplier, first tried to buy the operation, then set up its own after the Justice Department refused. GE is now building cars for the MTA and is a major factor in the market. But by no means is it the only newcomer. Besides Roar, 
The recently declining fortunes of the aerospace industry have sent the Boeing Company, Grumman Aerospace, Vought Aeronautics, and the Garrett Corporation shopping for orders. Lockheed has also looked at the market, and once and one non-aerospace company that has done fairly well in the highway sector of the commuter market, General Motors, plans to sell commuter rail cars also. All of the new flurry of competition has made people such as Dr. William J. Ronan, the MTA chairman, happy because it has not only introduced more price competition, but also technological competition. Executives of Pullman and St. Louis Car have cried foul when the United States Transportation Department recently awarded Boeing a $10.5 million three-year contract to manage efforts to develop an advanced rail car system, officials of the companies publicly and privately accused the government of poaching on their preserve as a political gesture to ease unemployment in Seattle and elsewhere. They contend that in the last five years or so, they have not ignored new technology and point to their role in improving transit operations in Chicago, Philadelphia, and Cleveland. When the battle is over, it appears that the laurels will go to companies that can do the most to produce reliable equipment while at the same time lowering costs. Federal and state transportation officials have been stunned and recently have been stunned recently by low bids for new cars in excess of $400,000 each in New York, San Francisco, and Philadelphia. By comparison, New York State paid about $217,000 for its initial Long Island Railroad cars, and the new BART cars will cost about $270,000 each. The car builders will see the first substantial impact of the new federal aid program in car orders now on the horizon in Washington, D.C., New York City, and Philadelphia. Originally, the company was to have delivered its 10 prototypes last December. Nine were delivered by then, but the final one was rejected by BART officials because of a variety of performance problems. War officials have taken the blame for some of the problems, but they attribute many of the difficulties to the Westinghouse Corporation, the prime electric propulsion subcontractor. The tenth car with all improvements was delivered to BART last month. If it is accepted, War says it will roll out the first production models in October and the 60 needed to start the new BART service will be delivered in late March or early April. War's problems have delayed the start of service by about six months. We have reason to believe car 10 will be in good shape and will be able to go ahead, B.R. Stokes, BART's general manager, said in an interview. In the end, we think we will have the finest transit car in the world. War said he Roar, he said, has some things to learn, and in some cases, they had to learn the hard way. They've come through the learning curve, and they are very much wiser. Roar's problems have ranged from the aerospace manufacturer's traditional difficulty in controlling weight to devising a coupler that would work with the high-performance cars. One nagging problem, a tendency of the Westinghouse motors to short-circuit because of particles picked up at the third rail, is believed to have been solved by the addition of filters. Mr. McCreary said ROHR had tackled the problem of applying aerospace knowledge in systems management and structure design, quality control, fabrication, and other technologies to the project by teaming aerospace specialists with managers experienced in other industries such as truck manufacturing. He said he believed aerospace technologists had much to offer the rail industry, but asserted its potential was limited by transit operators' traditional practice of soliciting bids with detailed, narrowly defined lists of specifications. The best thing they could do, he said, to lower costs of transit cars would be to establish functional specifications and let the industry put its ingenuity to work to meet them rather than tying us down with rules and regulations. And that's the end of the article.
Now, that was quite an interesting article, wasn't it? Now, the Roar Corporation then went on to build the first batch of subway cars for the Washington, D.C. Metro, and the first part of that system opened in 1976. Beyond that, they built no more subway cars. They left the transit car building business. Now, Roar uh, also had in mind a multimodal transportation system that they were going to build that was going to be used all over the country. They participated in the Transbus program in which they built three prototype buses of the future. Uh, that turned out to be a disaster. Each of the three buses that they built cost $2.5 million each, and one of them spontaneously exploded on a highway in Arizona. They also had the monocab system, which was an elevated personal rapid transit system that didn't work out at all. And they also built the prototype uh, Aerotrain. They were one of three companies that built uh, air cushion vehicles uh, that were tested out in the Pueblo test track in Colorado. And they only built one uh, aero train and that went absolutely nowhere. So now you know why aerospace companies don't build for mass transit. Now, if uh, the St. Louis Car Company or the Bud Company or Pullman Standard had built the BART cars or the Washington, D.C. Metro cars, which they were fighting for, would one of those three old line car builders have survived? That's a good question, and nobody has the answer to it. Nobody really knows because there weren't that many orders for transit vehicles back then in the 1970s and into the very early 1980s. Things started to change in the mid-1980s or so, but it's really a speculation whether or not uh, the St. Louis Car Company, the Bud Company, or Pullman Standard would have survived. Anyway... Thank you very much for watching this video, and as always, have a great day. Bye.